Federico, I saw your talk yesterday at OSCON. It was fascinating, and it seems like we might be on the edge of a new stage of miniaturization. Uh, tell us about this Transcend card. So it, uh, the reason why the Transcend Wi-Fi SD card is interesting is that you could conceptually think of it as as a Raspberry Pi in SD card format size mm -hmm. with Wi-Fi built in. So what you have as a device is an SD card that has an ARM 9 class processor. It's an extremely popular processor. I believe ARM uh, reports that more than 9 billion of them have been made over the years. It's an ARM v5 architecture, so it's not quite a Raspberry Pi that would be ARM v6, but it's close cousin. Mm -hmm. It's an embedded processor, but it can run Linux just fine, and as a matter of fact, internally it runs Linux 2.632, one of our most popular kernels ever. And it has a reasonably complete binary support package where it comes to the application that it is performing. But my interest is in making it a little bit more complete so that we can cover uh, broader random applications like you know, mm -hmm. any use that you could come up with that requires something that is either very low power, the, um, the card will draw around 200 milliamps at peak and less if there are no connections. So it gives you potentially the ability to have something very long lived on battery or something that requires large enough storage. And um, the joke that I was telling the other day is that you could potentially make, since all of this is in the size of an SD card, you could have uh, a server in your wallet or you could make a server throwy, so to speak. Uh, so the, the scale is interesting, the price is interesting, it's similar to, uh, to Raspberry Pi in price. And uh, I think the one limitation you pointed out was that because it's so low power, it does not have the um, reach of a normal Wi-Fi thing. Yeah. That's right. Um, the, the antenna is not a full 3 dB antenna, and unfortunately the card doesn't have an antenna connector there, so we cannot attach a bigger antenna. And also, it is pretty clear that the card is not drawing the maximum power that, uh, that the Wi-Fi spec would allow so you won't get the full Wi-Fi range. But um, you will get a range that I believe will be exceed Bluetooth, and it's, um, it's one limitation. So you won't get full Wi-Fi range. The other limitation that you will get is that um, the SoC has 32 megabytes of RAM. Now, if you're an embedded developer, that is entirely adequate for building an embedded system. If you are starting from the point of view of a Raspberry Pi, where you effectively have what is a small desktop computer, then you see the difference. You are going from half a gig of RAM or more to 32 uh, megs. You are not ready for that transition. But if you are starting as an embedded developer, 32 megs on a 3 point, uh, 2 point, um, 632 kernel is entirely fine. Still, I could see this being very useful for wearables or maybe for um, substitutions for the uh, RF, RFID chips and things like that. And uh, apparently the only commercial use is to be put in a camera so it can transmit pictures to your social network or something. It seems like a real shame to be using it for such a limited purpose. Yeah, the, uh, the SDK, uh, there is some vendor that then uh, sells to... Um, um, to um, consumer product makers, and there are at least four cards that I'm aware of that are made using the same uh, upstream hardware that is made by KA6. Um, and the application is entirely, you put this card in your, in your camera, it will download the pictures, they will be on your phone, they could be live on your phone, or they could be downloaded later, and then through other software you could put it on Flickr, Facebook, and so on. But it is effectively a computer with 16 or 32 gigs of storage, a reasonable processor that's running at 200 megahertz, very low power draw, and like you said, it, mm -hmm. it seems like the new uh, scale that this enables, it's, it's like the Intel Edison in the original demo format, the SD card mm -hmm. format, not what actually was released. 
it could enable um, new applications. And I, I was joking that now you could build a, a BioWolf cluster in a shoebox, but that, that was meant only as a joke. The, the low power and large storage seem to be the interesting angle. So you're working right now on figuring it out and getting some more documentation out there. Uh, yes, so there is a large community of people in many countries. I've had to use Google Translate to read things in German, French, Japanese, and I believe Korean recently. Uh, so the community really has figured all out already. Um, and it's spread around 20 or so blogs where uh, one hacker has figured out how to rebuild the kernel without the, without the configuration file that usually is found in proc. Even that was stripped for, for size reasons. So he looked at the case sims and with a lot of patience, he rebuilt the configuration and he has published it. Uh, others have figured out how to um, open up the f f uh, file format that's used to update the firmware. So we know how to update the firmware. We know how to rebuild the kernel. Uh, we know all of the details, but it's spread in different blogs as different people were figuring out different parts of the problem. And since uh, replacing some of the applications, like putting it a new busy box in, or maybe adding SSH in, um, require a little bit more work, uh, what I want to do is create a single article where all of this is um, summed up and uh, referred back to the original sources if you need them, but you have a concise view of start here, this is what you do, and then you have a working system. And um, I would like to get that done. And uh, right Busybox, Busybox would provide a set of embedded tools that would make it easier to make whatever you want with it. Yeah, it's, uh, the card is Perl in it. So I, I like to say that when there is Perl, everything is already set, <laughs> because you don't really need to build new binaries. You can use Perl for any application that you want to build there. But there are some tools that you need cross-compiled, like um, the SSH, the SSH uh, mm -hmm. server, for example. And I would like to have all of those resolved. So you can use Perl as a dynamic system to create your own application, but you have all the system-level tools already sorted out. But you're telling me about the people working on this around the world. Reminds me of the incredible strength we have in uh, hacker communities, yes. that they have figured this out collectively. It even reminds me of the uh, when the uh, iPhone first came out and there was no uh, public API and a bunch of people figured out the API hidden inside. This is um, similar. That, I think that was an, that is an interesting example because it's well known that Steve Jobs didn't want the App Store initially mm -hmm. and he was not an easy person to convince, but he became convinced that app stores were actually a good idea mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the momentum of interest of so many developers. So if it's possible to convince Steve, <laughs> then uh, yeah. it looks like numbers really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't believe this is the only SD card like that. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. There are at least four systems that I know about. Uh, one that is very interesting is called PQI AirCard. Mm -hmm. It's effectively functionally identical to the Transcend card, but it is built as an SD card adapter. So potentially you could put in there any mini SD card with any storage that you want as long as it's spec compatible and then have the embedded system part, the processor, the wireless radio and so on coming from the adapter. So that would give you some flexibility as part of the, as for the storage part. And there are a couple of details that I like which are um, that if you open up the card, the pads for the, the onboard serial are labeled, so it's very easy to bring out the serial port if you need that level of access to the system. And uh, it's not as easy on the Transcend where it's not documented and you need to probe. There is another thing to document what the pads are. Um, interestingly, the system also has primitives for a buzzer but most of these boards don't have buzzers on board. However, I'm pretty sure that the pads on the back of the card would allow you to, uh, to solder on a buzzer, and that gives you a way to alert that something has happened, like a new picture has been downloaded or something like that. So there really are some great things happening in the hardware space, and we can only hope that the free software, the open source part of it, expands. Yes, um, I think that that's true. 
Uh, hardware has been a very fast-moving space in the last few years. Uh, well, you guys even have started a new conference all around mm -hmm. hardware, so yeah. <laughs> that is a very good metric. The Sawat that. conference, yeah. Um, but I think open source hardware in general has been interesting, and these hacks where we find Linux on systems that are not necessarily open, but we can still get access to the system and, and use it as a developer platform are very interesting. And a few years ago, we saw the Western Digital MyBox had this capability. And now uh, the Transcend card, I think it's, it stands out because this was pointed out almost two years ago. And Transcend made, obviously, a choice not to lock us out of the cards. Mm. They are letting us play with the cards. And that is, uh, that is great because it gives them another use case for people purchasing the cards and thus uh, a platform to play with. Void your warranty. Avoid your work. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Sure thing. Always a pleasure.